for coming. I can see some people like slowly making their way in, but I'm gonna slowly start with the introduction. Uh, thank you everybody for coming to the first public lecture of this year. And um, I'm very excited because we've got Professor Angela Zhang with us, who is now in Southern California, was before that in Hong Kong. And she's been kind of all over. She's been in London, in Chicago. I found out she knew Judge Posner, which for some of you students, at some point, this name will ring a lot of bells. Um, she's very exciting. She has won prizes for her articles, and she has written a book about Chinese antitrust exceptionalism. But her latest book, High Wire, is about how China regulates big tech. And it's really cool. Um, I read it, and then I realized I could have read it for free, so I'm just going to share this with you. The university has access to the book online. You can read it, so you have no excuse. Okay? So after this, you're going to be super excited, and you're going to go to the university library and read the book. Yeah? Okay. Thank you, everybody, um, for coming. And you don't really want to hear much from me, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to immediately invite Angela to talk, and then after that, we can have some Q&A questions. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming, Angela. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I am uh, Angela. I am uh, I'm usually in LA, but I happen to be um, close by. And I said, why not drop by a uh, creek? And um, it's wonderful to see you guys here. So the book was released in April this year. And um, it's about six months. And so far, so good. Um, I, uh, I was invited uh, to give a talk in Edinburgh um, this morning by a group of investors. And I think, um, and one of the feedback I received is um, the, the investors who bought in your book must have earned a lot of money in the recent Chinese stock market rally. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know you, you probably don't follow Chinese uh, stock uh, lately, but the, just a past couple of weeks, China's Chinese government released the biggest uh, stimulus package since 2008 financial crisis. And the market went up 30%. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's why. You know, this book is about money. And uh, it's going to sell. Um, uh, obviously, only relevant to you if you're buying Chinese stuff like Alibaba or Tencent. Um, so I'll start uh, by telling you why this book matters a lot for the financial market. Why I have, you know, this is one of the most consequential areas of Chinese law or in global tech law uh, with this very small. Uh, uh, little precedent. So on the Christmas Eve of 2020, uh, almost four years ago already, um, the Chinese uh, State Administration for Market Regulation, which is China's antitrust watchdog, released this one sentence announcement. You know, sorry for it, it's in Chinese, but basically it's saying a very brief sentence saying that we are conducting a choose one for uh, an investigation into Alibaba for its choose one for two business practice. Okay, and then ten minutes later, the People's Daily, which is the party mouthpiece, um, released a very long commentary endorsing uh, the agency's investigation, and that similarly was prepared well in advance, right? I and mean, this was well orchestrated regulatory move. Guess what the market reaction is? Um, the next day, Alibaba stock tumbled more than 10%. Okay? That was a firm um, worth six, 700 billion US dollars. It wiped out over 100 billion US dollars market cap from this company. Okay? So despite the fact that this firm eventually received a $2.8 billion fine, which is the highest fine in Chinese antitrust history, it was nothing compared with the market reputation damage you know, this market sanction it had already received on the day of the announcement of the investigation. Okay? So this is what the book talks about. I mean, why does China want to crack down on its most promising, most dynamic um, private enterprises? And what are the consequences of these, this crackdown and how China uh, will regulate its tax sector in the future? What is the global implication? And, and as well as how China will regulate AI. Um, so you can see, you know, over the following months, this firm lost over 75% of its market cap, right? And so at its peak, 
in 2021, Alibaba's worth $800 billion, and today this farm um, is worth um, nearly $200 billion. So I'll start by uh, introducing the dynamic pyramid model, which is the central theme of the book, explaining how China regulates and governs, and it's actually a very versatile model, not only helping us to think about how China regulates the tax sector, but in general, also the policy challenges China is facing today. You know, whether we are talking about a deflation challenge where it's in the news every day and it's affecting the stock market volatilities every day, which is why I'm invited to Edinburgh, or whether we are talking about what happened in the past, like how China managed COVID-19 pandemic, how China conducted the property crackdown, how China managed the energy crisis, as well as how China regulates big tech. And then I'll apply the tech crackdown to explain how this model works, and then look forward uh, to China's tech uh, AI regulation. So this uh, dynamic pyramid model was really inspired by system thinking, which sees our world as a very complex, interconnected system. Okay, So regulation is not so simple. When you when regulators introduce a certain piece of legislation or, a, or conduct certain action intervening to the economy, it could generate consequences. And oftentimes, these consequences are not intended. Okay, So these are the unintended consequences that you don't want. So it's a really, really complex system we're talking about. Now, in terms of the Chinese system, I identify three distinct features each corresponding to the structure, process, and the outcome. In terms of structure, I describe it as very hierarchical, and that's very different from the uh, liberal, uh, Western liberal democracies, in the sense that the players involved in the regulatory system, they're situated in a hierarchy. It's a very tightly centralized hierarchy system. And then in terms of process, I describe it as very volatile because typically it's characterized by cycles of regulatory tightening and then regulatory easing. Right? And then lastly, it is the outcome. I use fragility to describe the outcome um, because oftentimes you know, these measures are well intended, but um, they can lead to unintended consequences and generally significant backlash. And it often takes a long time for the regulators and the top policy makers to realize their problems. And by the time they revert course, it's often too late, right? I mean, so remedying the situation could be extremely costly. That's why I said it's very fragile. We can use China's tech crackdown as a case study to illustrate this. Now, so here we have the four players situated in the hierarchy, right? In the early days uh, of China's internet uh, economy development, the top Chinese uh, leaders were very supportive of the internet sector. They see it as the new productive force at that time, right? I mean, so now we have the AI Plus initiative back then around 2005, you heard about the Internet Plus initiative. And um, this was actually the slogan and this kind of proposals introduced by coined by you know Chinese big tech firms and they use this to uh, you know, lobby the regulators as well as lobby the, the top policy makers. And in the response, they receive very favorable policy treatment. So despite the fact that you see tensions starting to build up at the platform level, there's a lot of complaints arising from um, the public, the regulators, remember, this is something fundamentally different from what you see here and in China. Regulators, they look upstairs rather than down, right? I mean, they are not held accountable to the public. They only respond to the top initiative. So because the top were supportive of the internet sector. So instead of taking very aggressive stance to regulate um, these tech firms, they took a very lax stance, okay? And so um, enforcement was lax. It's not that, that they're not doing anything. You know, they have vast regulatory discretion deciding what to do, so they can pick and choose what tools they use to discipline the tech firms. And so the tech firms would not really deter, but most importantly, the information transmission between the regulator and the top leaders were very slow. In other words, the top leaders were not, you know, didn't know, you know, these sectors have grown to be really unruly and has been super concentrated and generate a lot of uh, problems. It wasn't until this incident, um, I don't know how many of you have heard about, you know, Ant Group's IPO or Jack Ma's speech, but for those of you who, you know, 
interested in the Chinese political economy, this is really an iconic event um, because it's kind of marked the tipping point of how China uh, regulate its big tech sector because ever since the Jack Ma speech and the debacle of AM Group's IPO, um, it's, the direction is de decisively pointing towards regulation. Okay, so what happened to that speech and what happened to the AM Group's IPO? And I will uh, allow me two minutes to explain what does AM do. Okay, so AM Group is China's <laughs> largest fintech company and actually the world's largest fintech company that was thinking about going to be listed in Hong Kong and in Shanghai in late 2020. And this firm was initially spin up from Alibaba. Okay, it owns China's largest payment app for Alipay, which is used by over 80, close to 90% of the Chinese population. You can imagine it's a huge number of people, over 800 million people use this app. And over the years, and uh, leverage its massive user base in Alipay into all sorts of financial services in wealth management, in credit, uh, loans, and in insurance, okay? And it grew so quickly, okay? By the time when the firm went on IPO, look at its market valuation. It earned the valuations of 320 billion US dollars, okay? What does that mean? That firm at the time was less than six years old, and it has a market valuation higher than JP Morgan, the largest bank in the world, okay? So that put the Chinese financial regulators on a high, on a high alert, right? I mean, look, I mean, this looked like a big bubble in the making. This firm before was just a payment app, and then now it's become the biggest bank in the world, and Jack Ma has become the richest person in China. And what Ant did, okay, other than its successful leverage of its user base and expanding the credit tax business, is that Ant act as an intermediary connecting borrowers, ordinary users, um, like you and me, with the state-owned banks. So it's an intermediary, um, and it doesn't shoulder any liabilities, right? I mean, so it's just trying to facilitate as many loans and transactions as possible so that it can earn more commissions. So the, so the Chinese financial regulators was very about the typical moral hazard risk because M would want to you know, facilitate more transactions, um, to earn more commission, but it doesn't care about default risk, okay? So that was the moral hazard risk, but what put them on more high alert is the Ant valuation, because Ant, right before its IPO, changed its name from Ant Financial to Ant Group, okay? Why does it do that? Because it doesn't want to be viewed as a financial institution. And it, instead, it, it pitched itself as a tech fin rather than a fintech, okay? As a tech fan, I'm a tech firm, I can earn four times as high valuation in an IPO than I was a financial institution. Because if you're a financial institution, you're subject to a lot of financial regulations, right? I mean, you'll have satisfied the capital reserve requirement, all sorts of ratios imposed by Basel, right? And as that, I'm none of this. I'm just an intermediary connecting ordinary buyers and sellers, right? I mean, of, of these loans, right? So, so from the perspective of Chinese financial regulator, this firm is not just, you know, we're not, not, not only worry about moral hazard. This firm has become a systematic risk to the Chinese financial system, given its scales and its size, okay? And that explains why the Chinese government, at the 11th hour, you know, decided we have to suspend Ant's IPO, right? I mean, even just two days before its launch, it decided we need to do that because we saw there's a big, big bubble in the making, right? I mean, and it's also a wake-up call for the Chinese Communist Party. Look, I mean, Alibaba is not just selling clothes or, you know, Tencent is not just selling video games. This company is selling financial services that can potentially disrupt the Chinese financial stability, and that really touched the sensitive nerve of the Chinese Communist Party. Right? So, they, so this is the point where the top leaders woke up. No more information asymmetry between the regulators and, and the top leaders. And by the way, at that point, financial regulators were very upset about what Jack Ma said during the speech. It was very arrogant. They just went all in and reported the matter to top leaders. Right? No more information asymmetry. And then the top leaders mobilized a massive enforcement campaign, right? This is a very um, distinct feature of the authoritarian regime where they can really mobilize everybody, uh, all the regulators, to do things. 
And because there is very little checks and balance in the system, so they can do things move ahead very quickly. Like, I mean, they can just make an announcement, oh, we are investigating Alibaba, and then the firm is like already gave up, right? I mean, four months later, they impose a fine of $2.8 million on the firm, and the firm said, thank you. And they vowed with, you know, compliance. Okay, so they can, they can bring in the firm very quickly, and at this point, the Chinese government also introduced the common prosperity slogan to appeal to the popular mass, right? So, but of course, the platform doesn't give up. They continue to lobby. They try all sorts of means, and they're also trying to adapt to the new policy. Now, starting in early 2022, things are not looking good for the Chinese economy because China already entered into lockdown for the third year, and um, the economy was going downhill, and there was a massive sell-off of Chinese stock in March 2022 because of a series of negative news about you know, how the U.S. is going to delist Chinese uh, companies listed in the U.S. and uh, all the Chinese internet stock, are they still investable or not, right? So there was a massive sell of Chinese stock and that really alarmed the Chinese top leadership. When, so it was at that point that Vice uh, Premium, the, the Vice Premium Liu He convened an emergency meeting among all the top um, Chinese uh, ministries and then vowing to ease uh, regulation. So they basically, you know, convene a meeting and then make a big announcement, we are going to ease regulation, okay? And ever since then, you see a regulation return to routine and normal enforcement and things have become very, very quiet, okay? For the perspective of our students or my fellow lawyer friends, right, that means no more working on the weekends. And now you're worrying, worrying about billable hours, right? I mean, there's no more work uh, coming. Uh, co coming from the enforcers, right? So now you see this kind of silico, uh, this silico pendulum swing. Now, despite the easing, the damage was done, okay? Over this 18 months crackdown, the Chinese internet stock lost over a trillion dollars market cap, okay? And it was said that, now think about, you know, at its peak, companies like Alibaba and Tencent were close to one trillion market cap, and these are the largest in putting themselves, putting them at the top ten of the biggest internet companies in the world. Right at one point, Tencent even surpassed Meta's market valuation. Okay, but if it look at it today, you know, all the top ten Chinese firm combined, their market valuation is less than one single U.S. company, Nvidia. Okay, so. If anything, the, the irony is that Chinese crackdown actually undermined its own tech sector. It's not really helping China to be more uh, competitive in its tech rivalry with the U.S. Now, at the same time, as the private retreat, state started to advance, right? I mean, for instance, during the crackdown, the Chinese government made very aggressive uh, investment into some social media companies uh, by investing in the so-called golden share stock, okay? So basically, these farms are privately owned, but the government invests in one or two percent nominal interest in those farms, and in return, the government can appoint a representative to the board of those companies and can uh, influence certain important decisions on the farm. Right? I mean, that also put farms on high, put investors on high alert. Right? I mean, that basically helped the Chinese Communist Party to gain more influence and control over these companies. And during this period, China was able to push through some of the strictest tax regulation. And for those of our students here who follow China's internet development, you will see this is the busiest and craziest time. Um, and you see China's uh, introduced a series of data regulation, this personal information protection law, which is closely modeled after the it was a copy and paste of the GDPR, right? Um, but the irony is they hardly enforce it. Um, and they also amended its anti-monopoly law and uh, also pushed through some of the very stringent cross-border data transfer rules, even more stringent than what you see in the EU, although recently they wound down these rules. But you see, over this time, you know, there's a lot of regulatory activities basically enhancing regulatory control over Chinese farms, right? So in the book, um, there is uh, this very um, diagram, smart diagram, um, that shows, uh, basic summarizes basically everything I just said, right? I mean, when you ha have a very high ratio, regulatory um, structure, it tends to lead to a lot of volatility in the regulatory outcome, okay? And there's three channels of influence here. 
Plus, the Chinese top policymakers, think about people um, at the top leadership level, right? They are walking on high wire when it comes to regulating government and the economy. There's a lot of things on their plate. They care about national security. They care about economic growth. They care about social stability. And all these things are not necessarily compatible with each other, right? So they have to constantly make the juggling act like the man on high wire. And that leads to volatility in the policy process, right? And that explains why you see so much you know, dramatic policy reversal all the time. But other than that, there's two other sorts of um, channels of influence. One is the absence of checks and balance, the style of Western uh, institutional constraint on agency. Enforcement is lacking in China. So agency, the good thing is agency can move ahead very quickly if they decide to do something. The downside is that they move too quickly, right? You still need the democratic um, uh, oversight over agency actions, right? So, so that tends to give rise to agency overreach. So in China, then you tend to see this kind of paradoxical phenomenon that agencies either do very little, right? Because, because of the bureaucratic inertia or because they're not sure if what they're going to do might conflict with the top's mandates, or they do too much, right? Because the reason they do too much is once they hear, oh, this is what the, the top leadership wants, they will all flop and then try to do as much as possible to demonstrate the loyalty. And by the way, they act without constraint, right? I mean, so agency overreach is very common, right? This also leads to a lot of volatility in the policy process, and that's why you see the regulatory pendulum can swing very quickly in China, unlike in the US or the EU. And most importantly, the third channel of influence is information deficit in the hierarchical system, okay? There's a lot of advantages with a authoritarian system, unlike what you heard in the Western me media. It seems like everything China does is negative and it's really bad, right? I mean, there's, there's nothing good coming out from China. But if you really live and work in China, you will start to appreciate the efficiency of the authoritarian government. They have the fastest high-speed train. It's super convenient. You want to walk, walk, walk around. I mean, it's a very efficient government. Um, even if you know, there's tons of complaints about uh, facial recognition technology, you can see you know, it also benefits the society in many ways. So, so authoritarian government, they have the, a lot of advantages. But they come with an inherent weakness is the information deficit. Because it's a very hierarchical system, information don't travel very freely in the system, right? Because of the suppression of the information control at the public level, right? The public complaints don't tend to be voiced out uh, to the public, right? And also the bureaucracy itself, they have their own bureaucratic interests and not you know, suppressing information or distorting information, delaying information. So by the time the crucial information reached to the top, it often got delayed, okay, or got di di distorted. I mean, this is a common problem facing all authoritarian regimes. And so because of its delay, by the time it reached the top, problem usually got to become very bad, right? I mean, when you, you are remedying a bad situation, you typically need to come with more drastic uh, remedy, right? And that also gives rise to a lot of volatility in the system. Just think about what China is experiencing exactly at this moment because of deflation, right? I mean, deflation risk started a year ago, okay? Everybody's been talking about it, economists have been talking about it. It's all over the news, but China doesn't act until just now, okay? so. Same thing with China's COVID-19 management, right? I mean, everybody knows, and the Omicron is, is very contagious, it's very hard to control the zero COVID policy, but China stick to it for more than a year. And then until at the very end, they relax it, right? I mean, so you see, repeatedly see this kind of delayed response in an authoritarian regime, and that leads to a lot of volatility. And then both hierarchy and volatility tends to lead to fragility in the outcome because of the delayed response and the huge side effects it generate, create a huge market backlash in the economy, right? Think about what happened in China, right, with the tech internet crackdown. It was supposed to try to uh, introduce more competition in the market, inject more competition, and then attract new entries, and lower the level playing field, and then trying to uh, encourage more innovation. But it ended up discouraging innovation because nobody wants to invest in the Chinese market. All the investors have fled the Chinese market. So the whole internet sector continues to be dominated by the existing incumbents without any single new entry. So if anything, it just has the counterproductive effects of reducing competition in the Chinese internet sector. So if you read my book, chapter nine, I have a very 
negative review of the consequence, at least what we observed so far, right? I mean, it's so, so the side effects totally outweigh uh, the benefits it generates. But what this book also found, what my finding found, is when you have a very fragile outcome, okay, when investors have fleed the market, when the private sector has retreated, the state started to advance into the system, the state institutions. They start to make more investment in the private sector, trying to fill in the void left by the private sector, right? And the state become more influential, have more control in the internet sector. And the state also, through its regulatory control, all sorts of tools, has been able to better discipline and control the tech firm. So you reinforce the hierarchy. So allowing the state much tighter control over the internet economy, and now we have a very clear feedback loop, right? So it's become like a vicious cycle. We have more hierarchy, more volatile, which is, will predict, you know, according to my model, it will, it's bound to lead to more volatility and it's bound to lead to more fragility, okay? Now, so how do we apply this model to think about how China will regulate AI? It's a particularly regenerative AI. It's very disruptive and transformative. Um, technology. On the surface, if you look at what China has done, it looks like China is very, very strict with AI. Okay, um, and it's not surprising in a way because this is a authoritarian regime. It's inherently insecure about information control, and with the emergence of ChatGPT, that puts the Chinese Communist Party on high alert because it's much harder. It becomes even harder to control the output um, from, from the AI services, right? I mean, so you saw um, the China cracked down on a lot of, two months after GPT was launched, cracked down a lot of GPT live services in Apple's App Store. And six months after Check GPT release in April 2023, China already introduced rules to regulate generative AI. In April, in August last year, China already promulgated the law to regulate generative AI. And by the way, China is the first country, and I think believe so far the only country to introduce kind of like a licensing regime uh, for offering AI services to the public. So you don't, you don't even, I know EU has an AI app, right? I mean, does everybody say it's very strict, but it's not a license requirement, right? I mean, for the most part, it's a self-assessment requirement, right? But in China, if you want to introduce a, a checkbox to the public, right? You need to go to the Cyberspace Administration of China and obtain its green light before you can introduce such services to the public. Right? I mean, so this is kind of like an ex ante requirement, sort of kind of like an administrative license. And so this gave people the impression that China is very strict with AI regulation and it's going to hold back its AI development. Right? But if you read the book and apply the framework I have introduced, you think about, you know, what does China want from AI? I mean, just by looking at the book cover, you see, you know, a foreign terror regime has very complex utility function. We worry about information control because that can, you know, that can interfere with public discourse. But it also cares deeply about the enormous economic benefits that AI can bring to the society, right? I mean, the Chinese economy is facing the deepest economic challenges in its past three decades. And, and China is in the painful process of restructuring its economy from a very, uh, you know, investment-like model to a consumption model. And they want to be like a high-tech and high-manufacturing superpower, right? China is exporting EV all over the world, batteries, solar panels. China want to be an AI superpower. How can you possibly have both, right? I mean, strict regulation and uh, AI development. So what I um, argue in the book and also uh, subsequently followed by a paper called The Promise and Parents of China's Regulation of Artificial Intelligence, I argue that, look, I mean, we can't just look at things on the surface, right? I mean, even when you look at the Chinese law itself, we need to pay attention to the expressive powers of the law. In other words, there is information values in the law itself, which matters more than what the law says. Okay? Um, and specifically, I draw people's attention to the signaling function and the coordination of the Chinese AI legislation. Now, on the surface, 
if you look at China's regulation, give an example of China's regulation to regulate generative AI, it looks very strict. And it's quite comprehensive. It covers every single aspect. You know, when you offer AI generative AI services, you're not supposed to violate IP law, data privacy law, labor law. You're not supposed to generate any bias. You need to obtain a license, right? You need to fulfill all this content moderation requirement, and blah, blah, blah. Okay? But if you look closer, right, what this law does, um, it's more to send a very strong pro-growth signal to the public, okay? The first draft of the law was introduced by the Cyberspace Administration of China, which is China's internet watchdog. So it was very strict. Mm -hmm. But when the law was finalized four months later, it was significantly diluted, okay? So it's been significantly watered down. I mean, people say, you know, in the EU, the AI app is also watered down, but not to the extent like in the Chinese, um, in the Chinese law itself, right? So the watering down and plus the participation of a lot of other regulators in the legislative process send a very strong signal to the investment community that um, China is going to take a very cautious and tolerant approach in regulating this technology. And by the way, they write that into the law that we are taking a cautious and tolerant stance in regulating this technology. And they provide a very big carve out that was not in the previous draft that they only regulate those services that are offered to the public. In other words, if you are selling your AI services to Huawei or ZTE or Microsoft, you are not even covered by the law, right? So you understand where that's coming from. The Chinese Communist Party is concerned about content moderation, is concerned about interfering with the public discourse. But other than that, you know, it's less of a concern, right? I mean, we want to encourage industry growth. We don't want to create bad type. We want one of the small startups, uh, they can continue to innovate in the sector. So they create a very big carve out that you don't see in the EU, right? And the law also explicitly trying to coordinate, you know, different industry participants to power and to push AI development, right? I mean, it trying to coordinate different regulators, explicitly trying to coordinate them trying to coordinate the industry participants, um, you know, whether we're talking about the academics, right, or the, uh, the universities, or the industry associations, or the farms, right, tech farms themselves. They're trying to pull all the resources together and explicitly write into law that we need to uh, accelerate um, AI development. The law also explicitly mentioned that it will coordinate data and computing resources, which are the two essential inputs into training generative AI models, right? So despite the fact that China used to have an advantage in data, uh, particularly when it comes to facial recognition technology, but when it comes to generative AI, it doesn't because China has very few open source large language models. And to be started with, China has very few Chinese language uh, database to start with, right? Because the Chinese tech sector is very concentrated and most of the, pro the data is proprietary owned by the big tech farms. So there's very few open source large, large language models for Chinese farms to train. And so a lot of times they have to train on those public databases from the West, but that brings an alignment problem because those data are not being cleaned. You know, it's not aligned with Transcom as far as value. So when they train a model using the Western database sources, they then have to spend a lot of time filtering and then fine tuning the model. And it's all very costly, right? So China has very strong incentive to um, trying to create more data resources for uh, its AI companies. And, and it's currently in the process of creating some data alliances, and encouraging public and private institutions uh, to create those alliances so that help train the models, query how much it will help, right? But you can see the government is pushing towards that di direction. And China is trying its best to try to coordinate computing resources. Um, as you know, this is one of the biggest bottlenecks faced by Chinese AI firms because they cannot access the most advanced NVIDIA chips and due to the US export control. And China is doing everything it can and trying to overcome that challenge, although you know, it takes years away before China can develop its own AI chips. But what China does is that, look, I mean, we try to um, make it more efficient for farms to use AI uh, uh, computing resources. So now you see all over China data, uh, this kind of computing data center proliferation all over, all over the country. Right? And government also even offer vouchers to small and medium-sized companies to use their data center. 
and um, and Chinese government is trying to create a project called Western uh, Energy and, uh, and and Eastern Data. Okay, basically trying to relocate the data centers to the West because that's less populated. Utilities are pri uh, uh, prices are lower, and so it's more efficient uh, in in terms of energy use. Uh, and to train and deploy those AI models, although you know, query whether that will succeed because that also create all sorts of problems. But anyway, but you can see the authoritarian government can afford to do that, right? I mean, and so you see the law also trying to coordinate data and human resources. The law also trying to create uh, coordinate standard setting because trying to believe firmly that standard setting is the way to go for its technology companies. This is the way to really. Um, reap the most benefits from the technology right because you would want to be the center setter right and um and so the so chinese government's very you know do encourage um it's uh it's public and private institution to actively participate in standard setting and lastly the law even though they don't explicitly say also serves the function of coordinating local uh regulators because china is a very large country just like eu um, you know, have a lot of members. Say China have a lot of different provinces, and each province they have the incentive to introduce their own AI legislation. So having a national legislation also help help offer them guidance in terms of the, what the national authority wants to drive um, this part of the economy. So what China does is really to pull the whole of society of resources to develop AI. Okay, and that is evident in its way to regulate and govern its economy. And it's similar to its approach in um, in uh, other forms in the development of other types of technology. If you think about EV, if you think about a semiconductor, um, you know, high high end manufacturing, right? I mean, so this is kind of the I call it the Zhuo approach, the whole society approach to push forward uh, internet development. So I so. If we apply the dynamic pyramid model, you will see at the very early stage of the internet uh, regulation, regulation was actually very lax. Okay, so with AI, China is entering into this lax phase, this honeymoon period. Okay, query how long it will last until it tests. Okay, but it was a very long honeymoon period for the Chinese internet sector. Right, it wasn't until late 2020 that they started the reversal uh, with a, a massive crackdown. Right? And if we look across the world, I mean, how EU and the US is regulating AI, I mean, EU seemingly become a pioneer in regulating this technology with introduction of the AI Act, but EU actually already have a lot of different tools on its plate to regulate AI company, with particularly the GDPR and now the DMA and the DSA. I mean, these are all extremely powerful, and I would say it's actually probably the most potent tools that um, the, the EU regulators have in dealing with these AI firms, whereas the US seems to be sitting there talking a lot and there's all the bark and without bite, you know? So um, in, in a way, this kind of geopolitical rivalry between China and the US is also playing into the dynamics of the, of, of the AI regulation in, in both um, jurisdictions, okay? So with that, uh, I will stop and, um, in, and welcome your questions and, comments and if you want to follow more of my recent work because i'm spending all my time thinking about ai these days and um if you are an ai geek a nerd like me and uh, i look forward to more exchange uh, with you guys thank you, thank you.